Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler. I have two games from round three of the Tau 2016 Memorial. Before I get started, I wanted a word on the stats of the players we are looking at today. Our first game is the one between the two Russians, Nepomniachi and Kramnik. Nepomniachi, aka Nepo, accumulated one win and one draw. Kramnik scooped up two draws. Though Kramnik's ELO is just under 28.10 and Nepos is 68 ELO points lower, and to be more precise 27.40 exactly, Nepo is an extremely skillful player and should not be underestimated. Here we have move 30 and it is Kramnik's turn. Kramnik began to stumble when he attacked the knight on d5 because after the pawn exchange on g4, the knight rooted to c7 and black was already starting to feel the heat. And if black is not careful, the pin on d6 will result to the loss of the rook. Nepo here moved his king out of any possible pin and to h6, allowing the knight to jump to e8 and at the same time threatening the f-pawn. Kramnik did not worry about the lonely F pawn and had a different plan by repositioning his knight to B2. The taking of the bishop on D3 will lead to the disruption of the strong pawn formation of white and it would make it easier later on in the game to attack them. In addition, this will not allow any backing of the F pawn that is currently residing on f5. So with knight b2 and the immediate bishop e4 afforded the knight to jump to d1. Knight d1 has the aim to mess up white's pawn formation by adding pressure on the weak f2 spot. White followed with knight d6 and after king g5 the rook eliminated the pawn on f7 and it is here where Kramnik went horribly wrong. Instead of capturing the f-pawn with the knight, he did this with the bishop. How bad was this move? It was so bad that cost Kramnik the game, because rook g7 check pursued, leading the king to f4. Can you guess white's follow-up move? This was a stunning e3 check, which is a tremendous move. If the bishop takes, we have the magnificent f6 and the pawn is unstoppable. If now the pawn is removed by the knight, the bishop stands in unprotected and white can take him. So by taking the pawn with the king, the rook removed the pawn on g4 and the king occupied d2 with the idea to fork on e3 when the chance is given. Was this a sound tactic? We can answer this in just a sec. White went on with the same idea and allowed black to apply the fork. When the bishop evacuated to f3, black forked the king and rook with a check. White picked up the bishop, the knight collected the rook and the bishop captured immediately after. After this sequence of moves, White simplified the situation and came out much stronger. Was the tactic by black sound? No is the answer, as the rook was traded in for a knight and a bishop. We know that black has to move his king or rook out of the way to avoid the pin on e4, and did this with rook d5. What followed was a splendid and sleek move by white and attack the king with e4 check. King d3 followed, and Nepo played another magnificent move by pushing his pawn to f6. If it wasn't game over before, it is now, because should the king take, the bishop can pin the king and remove that strong rook from the center. Rook a5 was black's last resort, but who would have imagined Nepo's next move? Can you have a go here? This is bishop e2 check, and this is a real beauty of a move, 
because should King take, the pawn hits home. How? Simply with f7, and simply the rook being unable to reach the 8th rank first, because his attempt to reach a8 goes up in vain with bishop f3 check. Kremnik prevented this from happening and moved his king to d4. Here, Nepo pushed his pawn to f7, and with rook back to a8 and knight g5, Kramnik had had enough and resigned. I want to go back and look at the critical move in the game, and this is on move 36. Should Kramnik have taken on f2 with a knight, the game would be very playable and with a dead equal position. It was here where things went horribly wrong for Russians number one, which led him to resign later on. The second game I want to examine is the one between Anish Giri and Evgeny Tomaszewski. Giri with the white pieces was on one and a half points and Tomaszewski on just one half. The game kicked off with the Neo type Queen's Indian opening and Giri held a moderately strong positional advantage which did not last for long as Tomaszewski gradually improved his position. The game was not decided until the two players reached the end game with a knight and bishop versus two knights and an equal spread of pawns. It takes one wrong move to lose a game and this move can be as little as losing a pawn. This is the position reached at move 53 after white posted his knight on f7 attacking the black bishop. It was not until the point in the game when black came up with the wrong move and should he had played king d7 the game could have gone either way. Knight f8 check is met by king c7 and if knight e5 there is a good chance for a perpetual. Bishop h2, though not defined as a blunder, weakened up black's position significantly. Knight f8 still followed, but here the bishop became greedy and went for the pawn on f2. With the cunning f4, white lured the bishop to e3. White deliberately did not cover for the pawn, but went for a more interesting move, and should the bishop remove the pawn on f4, white could be compensated with the taking on g6. Black should have brought his king forward to c7 if he stood a chance to win, but instead it was here where he blundered big time with g5 costing him the game. The exchange on g5 gave Giri a huge opportunity to wrap it up with the following combination. Knight c6 to force the exchange, which black must reject through knight to g8, knight e6, again forcing the bishop to move out of harm's way and possibly to c1, and finally blasting his knight to g7, pinning both pawns and ready to take on the next move. So with king d7 and the taking on h5, white can take away another win. Geary, a master specialist of endgames, missed this move but did not disappoint because knight g6 was an equally strong move, forcing the exchange of knights on g6. We can spend a minute to see an alternative move, and for example knight to g8. This simply allows the white king to join the fun with d5, and a move too strong to ignore. If now king b7 to protect the pawn, the king moves right into black's territory with e6, and in a few moves the end for black is unavoidable. So having removed the knights and the knight posted on g6, with king d7, king d5, bishop e3, knight h4 and f4, Giri made the wrong turn and landed his knight on g6. Knight g5 however would have been a far better move, but again this did not matter much because not only white has a far superior knight versus a bishop, but white has all his pawns in squares, where the bishop simply cannot touch. 
As a result, it was simply a matter of time, and Black gave up later on in the game when the bishop was about to be lost. Without a shadow of a doubt, this was an extremely difficult game for both players and a very close call. What seemed to have been a small slip up by Black on move 56 also proved to be the beginning of the end. I hope you enjoyed both games and look forward to seeing you again with yet another interesting session. Feel free to comment or subscribe so that you can keep up to date with forthcoming events. Once again, thanks for watching.